In September last, the British photographer Jim Grover spent a day snapping people crossing Westminster Bridge. Locals and visitors, adults and children. It became a major exhibition. Yet strangely, none of these pictures shows a face. Grover says he wanted to capture aspects of life around that very busy London bridge that faces might distract from rather than illuminate. At first it seems just an artist's gimmick. But by excluding faces, Grover has indeed successfully focused on other important things. Activities, relationships, the natural and built environments, the beauty and depth of everyday life. And here I think there are parallels to be drawn with the life of a priest. Priests must look beyond our consumer rat race and its ephemeral offerings, realising there is more to be seen than first meets the eye. They must peer beyond the wisdom of this age in search for a deeper and more abiding wisdom. They must even see beyond the faces of their flock to the image of God in each one of them, to the soul behind the body, to the needs and purposes, relationships and histories, destiny and immortality. And if priests must look beyond the surface, they must ensure others see beyond them to the one in whose person they act. In this age of the personality cult, priests must remember that it's all about Christ and his people, not us. Brother John Wynne, of course, has a rather interesting face. A face that tells of his Vietnamese background from a family who arrived as refugees with John in the womb and raised seven children near the detention centre in Villawood. On his face we read the faith and fun of his vocation, intimated when as a child he played priest with fruit juice and a host cut from sliced white bread, no doubt from an excellent Vietnamese bakery and when he later persuaded Father Spillane to let him serve as an altar boy before he was of age and to keep serving long after he finished being so. A hobby that took him all the way to serving Pope Benedict the 16th Mass at World Youth Day in Sydney. As the boy grew into a man, the face smiled on architecture and acting. But Cardinal Pell, with his characteristic discretion, asked him directly after Mass one day, oh, have you ever thought of becoming a priest? <laughs> and thereafter, the hankering within was undeniable. His face also tells of the peace that comes through pursuing one's vocation faithfully. Writ in his enthralling smile, twinkling eyes and very capuchin beard. Yet I know he would want us to look beyond his eyes and beard to his humanity, his Christianity, his Franciscananity, and in a few moments time, his priesthood the priesthood of Jesus Christ. One of Brother John's name saints, Saint John of Constantinople, was nicknamed the Golden-Tongued 
on account of his wonderful preaching. John Chrysostom was not a Capuchin Franciscan, if only because they hadn't been invented yet in 4th century Asia Minor. But his peri Hirocines on the priesthood, part apologia for his life prior to ordination, and part Socratic dialogue on holy orders, might yet have something to say to this young Capuchin priestling. Like Grover's photos, John's tract insists that the priesthood is not about the lowly priest, but about the high priest, Jesus Christ, the one both from heaven and from earth, both of God and of humanity, and about the Holy Spirit, who is from him, rather like a science fiction wormhole or stargate that allows a priest to bridge these two universes of heaven and earth. Though a mere mortal, the priest joins the people offering the mass, but also the angels in service at God's altar. He carries the needs of those people to heaven, especially at the consecration, and brings back heavenly things for them. John Chrysostom's treatise was a crucial marker in the evolution of our understanding of the priesthood. On his account, the priest is not merely the bishop's eyes and ears and hands in the local area, though he is these things. Not merely the captain of the local parish team, though he is that too. But for Chrysostom, a Catholic priest is above all a minister of the word, like the prophets of old and apostles of new, described in our readings tonight as a voice for God. And a priest is also a minister of sacrifice. Like Elijah, with the immense multitude surrounding the altar, hushed as he laid the victim upon it and called down fire from heaven. But priests of the new covenant preach not just words, but the word made flesh, who is Christ, and who renders his hearers into saints. They call down not just flames, but the spiritual fire of the Holy Spirit that renders bread and wine and disciples into the body of Christ. Our first reading and epistle tonight recall that a priest is not his own man. He does not act out of his own genius or learning, his own virtue or vanity, not even his own passion and compassion. No, he is first of all God's man. And when he speaks, it must be God speaking not him. As our Lord points out in our Gospel, it was he who chose us, not the other way around. And so the priest's task is to imitate Christ's charity. The commandment to love one another as Christ loved us may seem impossible. Yet to be conformed to Christ, like the stigmatists from Francis of Assisi to Padre Pio, is to be enabled to look beyond the surface, captured by glimpses and photos, to the real human person beneath, so worthy of love that God would give his life on the cross for him or her. 
The role of the priest is thus awesome in both senses in which the word is used today. Terrible or awe-inspiring because Christ chooses as his priests ones like Jeremiah who say, I'm a child, Lord, with nothing to say. Or Isaiah who said, I'm a man of unclean lips. But awesome also in the sense of wonderful because of what Christ accomplishes through those mouths and hands. It might seem almost perverse to offer so high an ideal for the priesthood at the end of the Catholic wrap-up of the Royal Commission. That investigation has underlined the dangers of romanticising the priesthood and permitting a culture of clericalism that makes priests a caste, enjoying sacred power and human entitlement, yet beyond scrutiny and accountability. The revelations of ministerial failings have humiliated and humbled our church in Australia, and especially our bishops, priests and religious. Yet John Chrysostom identified the perennial risks of clericalism right back in the fourth century when he wrote, I know my own soul, how feeble and puny it is. I know the magnitude of this ministry and fear the gales that vex every priest. That most terrible rock that is vain glory, the waves of despondency, envy, strife and slander, the indecorous behaviour, desire for praise and honour, sorrow when fellow ministers prosper, teaching devised only to please, and paying court to the rich and powerful, sordid fear, feigned humility, sexual misdemeanours and flattering prelates. With St John Chrysostom, we quake before the greatness of the priestly vocation and the smallness of those called to it. But in the wake of the Royal Commission, we are surer than ever before that we need new priests of sound faith, evangelical zeal and personal holiness. In Brother John, we might just have such a man. During the World Youth Day year 2008, he dedicated himself to youth ministry with Sydney Catholic Youth Services and the youth of the world. He then came under the malign influence of Father Robert Stewart, and so was doomed to be a Franciscan. But to my delight, it was in the lead up to and during World Youth Day that he was confirmed in his priestly and religious calling. And so I can claim him as a Sydney World Youth Day vocation even if I never got him for the Sydney Seminary or for the Dominicans. Amongst the Capuchins, he says, he's been formed in joyful fraternity, willing self-sacrifice, ready trust in God. He is inspired by his brothers striving for holiness, service of others and witnessing to the world. My dear son and brother John, tonight God's people invite you to share in the most crucial aspects of their lives, their births, marriages and deaths, their sins and aspirations, their hunger for truth and love, 
their moments of touching the divine and also of desolation. Subject to your provincial and to your bishop, and united to your brothers in the order and in the priesthood, strive to bring the faithful together into one family. May they see on your shoulders, not just your face, but a faceless portrait of Christ shining forth. And may they hear from your lips, not just your words, but the golden words of Christ overflowing from a golden heart.